Good morning and hello everyone. Uh, welcome to CSIO release demo 06. So I'm really happy to announce that so we can release 06 very soon. Um, ideally this evening. Um, but at, at least within this week we are going to release. Uh, we have the we have the agenda for today's release demo. So first, so we will get the overview from our project manager, Andre, and afterwards uh, we will have four demos. So this, those are highlights of the release 0.6. Uh, before diving into the um, uh, sessions, uh, so let me explain the rules in this release demo. So the whole meetings will be recorded. And each demo has maximum 20 minutes, so that means it can be shorter. And 15 minutes for demo and five minutes for the Q&A session. So if the demo reaches 15 minutes and also the Q&A session goes to uh, more than five minutes, then I will uh, talk and I will say that the time is over. So please be aware of this. And if you have any questions during the demo, and please ask them in the Q&A session. And also, after this demo, you can contact us at any time on our Discord channels. Okay, so this is the rules. Then let's start. So the first one is from Andre. So this is 0 0.6 overview. Yes, thank you, Rina. So sharing my screen. Um, Right, what I wanted to share with you is, and I posted a link uh, to the chat, is uh, our uh, public roadmap that you also see on on GitHub and just walk you through what we um, had in mind for 0 0.6 and what we implemented. So uh, the first topic um, it was the um, uh, yeah, need to remove the dependency on system D. Um, as we realize, uh, we also need to support our other, other uh, platforms, uh, operating systems where system D might be a, a problem or not existent. Um, we wanted to be more flexible here and allow you to um, do that more freely and choose your um, preferred init system. Uh, and there is an, a good tutorial out there also how to do all of that. Another focus uh, for the release was really on the data model. As you can see, uh, we extended the data model to also support alarms and events. So this is uh, mainly focused on the Cumulosity mapper and Cumulosity integration at, at this point in time uh, to really extend that um, data model um, so the handling of measurements that we have today and extend it with uh, alarms and events to be able to um, you know um, have, have other types of, of uh, telemetry uh, going to um, cumulosity through the mapper and uh, one last point um, which was also quite important and there are some generic capabilities out of that is that um, we have a set of functionalities that allows to uh, basically um, there, there are examples like uh, configuring um, the capabilities of a device in a flexible way and reporting those to um, uh, an IoT platform. For now, it's again focused on Comolosity and that uh, allows us to also uh, be compatible uh, with the um, um, Cumulosity device certification service. Um, so that means that every device that runs uh, thin edge um, is compatible with Cumulosity and, and can be certified uh, by the new Cumulosity device certification service. Uh, again, something Cumulosity specific, but a lot of useful stuff that we also implemented in a generic way that can be used for uh, other platforms uh, as well. And right, uh, I don't want to spend too much time and we can dive into the demos. Thank you, Andre. Then, yes, we can dive into the first demo. Uh, the presenter is Alex. The title is Cumulosity IoT Device Certification Compliant. 
Um, okay, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, I'll be doing a uh, Cumulosity device making um, a device certification compliant with Cumulosity. And this will be in the context of uh, Cumulosity fragments, which was the final step to to have this um, certifiable by Cumulosity. Um, so Cumulosity fragments uh, is something that has been added and it's a feature that automatically by default will send uh, some information about the device. So by default, it will send something like this um, with a name field, the version of Cumulosity that is running and the URL. And this will be uh, visible in, in the cloud. And um, if, if you, sort of if you wish you can also now send uh, custom fragments so as you can see here below and what you what you need to do for this is um, to have a JSON file inside a directory named device in the root of your attached configuration and uh, you you fill this in and you will have it visible when you go to your device have it visible here. Um, okay. And so this was the, the last step to, to have it um, certification compliant. And I hope this is not getting in the way. I don't know how to. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So as you can see now uh, with this step, which was uh, sort of hardware information and basic device information that we now can be certifiable with Cumulosity. I think that's all I had to demo. So are there any questions? So, so the compliance is about the general connectivity and and device information right so uh, we're probably missing still some capabilities yes that's right i think you can see here but um so the focus was really to meet all the mandatory um capabilities for now Right. And for the optional capabilities, things like um, firmware management, uh, but also device configuration. So some of those we are still planning to focus on, like the configuration management, and then also that will come. Some of those are really specific to the device. Right. So here um, we also need to to uh, see whether we will have a so-called reference implementation, for example, that might be an example coming uh, from the team or for someone else. And then uh, depending on your device, um, firmware management, as you can imagine, can happen completely differently. So therefore, um, yeah, those optional modules, you know, uh, cannot always be implemented in a generic way. Uh, sure, yeah, no, no, just for my understanding. Uh, great work. Um, so the, the hardware information you said they are put in a file. Um, does it mean you need to specify them for starting Synedge or can they be changed? Uh, things like firmware information, availability, is it something we can then set during runtime as well? Uh, yes, so you will have to to change um, you'd have to change it here. As you can see, this is the information that you can see on the on the UI. And um, but then you'd need to to restart. So if I if I change this response interval to five, uh, you will not automatically see this update here it still says 60. Um, if you if you reconnect you will see it update uh, 
do we really have to disconnect and reconnect or just restarting the mapper process would that would well it? yes restarting the mapper process would would also do it okay thanks Yeah, thanks for that. Are there any more questions? OK, OK, seems. Yeah, seems no questions. Thanks, Alex. Then the next presenter is me, Rina. Um, the title is uh, the Moves a Dependency on System D from Titch. OK, let me share my screen. Okay, um, uh, first let me explain the background of this story. I think you are already familiar with Tetch Connect and Tetch Disconnect. So Tetch Connect uh, creates a, a mosquitoes a bridge configuration for Cumulosity, Azure, yeah, but also uh, Tetch Connect um, start the service, for example, uh, restart the service and also enabling the mosquito service and starting touch mapper service, enabling the touch mapper service and, and also for touch agent. And this uh, touch disconnect does the reverse. So stopping touch mapper CTY service, disabling touch mapper CTY service, and stopping touch and disabling touch agent. So uh, before the, this feature and the new implementation, uh, actually uh, those uh, restarting service, enabling service, uh, hard coded using system CTL, like system CTL, Restart mosquito. Yeah, this is a command behind this line restarting mosquito service. And for enabling some touch mapper, CHY, uh, uh, so this is the line we do, like what we did before, and enable touch mapper, CHY. This uh, starting services, enabling services um, are very convenient for the user because uh, they don't need to uh, start the service enabling the touch mapper, touch agent services manually, individually. However, um, it had a problem because system CTL is hard coded. Then what can you do for the systems uh, which doesn't have system CTL? Actually, yes, disconnect and this disconnect couldn't do the whole jobs for those systems. And with this uh, change, uh, now we don't hard code system CTL anymore. Um, you can give the configuration. So which command you want to use to enable the service, to start the service, stop the service, disable the service. So, how to do it? Uh, so, user needs to provide a configuration file to etc system.tomware. If you don't provide this file, then that case, uh, by default, we are going to touch connect and touch disconnect, are going to use bin system CTR. So, then how to configure it? So this is a configuration file. So the one uh, needs to be located etc system um, The first line you see name open RC. Uh, actually, this is system tomel is an example for open RC. So later I'm going to uh, demo how it works on the Alpine Docker, which doesn't support system CTL. Uh, name is just string actually. Uh, here, so we have this checking if system is available. So how to print out 
this word. And it's available, uh, needs to be configured some uh, command re returns zero. So also it's compatible to this line. So with touch connect and this always check the uh, service itself is available. I mean, this init system is available. For example, um, here it's Alpine Docker, I see service the shell, and then you see that it return zero. So this is, uh, is available. And restart, uh, you see now here placeholder, and this placeholder uh, will be interpreted to service name like mosquito, tetchmapper CHY, tech agent, tetchmapper as. So user needs to provide the command uh, that restarts the service. And stop is uh, basically the same as restart, so how to stop the service. And for unable, uh, this is a, it's like a system city and unable to touch my C So when you, when your device reboots, uh, if the service is enabled, uh, the service start automatically after the reboot. So again, this one is a placeholder. So user needs to provide how to enable the service. And disable is yeah, similar to enable. And the last one is active. It's actually used by touch disconnect. Uh, this one to check the status, um, some services running. So for example, uh, now this Alpine Docker, I can try a service. Uh, mos mosquito is now running. So then the return zero. Uh, for example, touch map uh, is not running now, so it returns three. So this is active. It's a command uh, which checks the uh, service status, and if service is running, that command needs to return zero. Okay. Yeah, this is a configuration file. How to configure? Also in our repository. There are samples, so the same 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 script as for OpenRC and also a system CTL. So you don't need to uh, give configuration file for system CTL because it will, we will use this one by default. Anyway, so I oh know RC status. So let me demo in the Alpine Docker. Here, uh, now Mosquito is running and we use OpenRC as a init system. Uh, for example, system city doesn't exist. Yep. And I have already some service files and under etc init D. So yes, so we have Mosquito service file, that isn't as CHY. So, and also the important, most important, um, I have the, the system.tomer file under etc. Tech system.tomer. Yes, same content as I sh show in the notepad. Okay, then start Tech Connect. Yes, then, so before I start, I use this touch connect CHY, uh, only Mosquito was running here. But now, this configuration file works, so that's why touch mapper CHY or touch agent started learning. Also, I can try with us, with us, so touch mapper as service will start. And now you see 
data mapper as service is also running. Yes, uh, this is uh, the or demo, but I wanted to show you. Do you have any questions? Uh, I think so. So just for understanding, what is the is available actually checking? It's only checking if the init system itself is running, right? Exactly. OK. If a device has that in its system or not, yeah, this is it's available. I have also a question, Marco, here. Yeah. Um, would it also be possible to just run the edge uh, executables using the command line? Or if we just start it up, give it a parameter, here's your configuration, just run. Um, sorry, I didn't get to your point. But we have a few processes that we have to start. Um, this is this is a dependency is, is Mosquito, right? It's so other software component. We can start that up using an init script. That's fine. But our thin edge uh, program to to run um, is there very is there a command line uh, that we can use to just start it up without any init system, etc. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, it's usually the binary is located. So, for example, touch agent uh, needs to run as touch agent user. So, for example, touch agent. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question correctly. Uh, but it, this one should work. And if we, if we just if we just put that in the config file, it will also work. Oh, or a or a bash script where all those. Uh, uh, no, uh, actually, not. Uh, yeah. So in inside the code, uh, we replace this one. a uh, placeholder, and if for example, if restart configuration doesn't have placeholder, I think it will fail. Okay, thank you. So, so if I got this right, um, we not remove the dependency to to an init process, but make it more flexible, right? Exactly. Sorry? Yeah, so you can choose the init process which you yeah, depending on your environment. Exactly. But we still need an init process. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Right. So would it be possible to just have some examples like you did now with the open RC? Uh, I'm not sure what, what else is there out there as a, in it. Uh, systems just to have these examples in the documentation or maybe even implemented in, in the net itself. Because if I understand it actually checks if the init system is available at the start anyway, right? So you could probably just go through the list of init systems, see which one is active, and then use that one. I think Rina can point it, but there is already a doc. Maybe Rina, you can highlight that doc, which contains uh, many of the other systems. Yeah. Yes, um, this is our repository CHIO. Mm -hmm. And now the location is CHIO configuration contribute system. Uh, now, for now, we have three examples. So, this is one for PSD service. Yeah. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, as as open RC and system D. Okay, so actually, the question Q and A time is almost over. Then, thanks everyone for listening.
And if there are more questions, then you can definitely type, type on the chat and we'll try to answer it on the chat. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Roshan. OK, then the next presenter is Alvin. The title is Alarm Data Model Support for Cumulosity IoT. Yeah, so, uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'll be dem demonstrating the extensions that we have done for our data model, so both alarms and events. So, yeah. uh, so let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. My turn. Okay, so hope you can see my browser and the terminal in front. So yeah, so uh, we. With this release, uh, we are adding support for two more types of data, uh, that is events and alarms, in addition to the measurement support that we already had from uh, the very first release. Uh, I'll start with events. So events are used to represent signals or uh, say some events that happens uh, happens in your in your environment. So, for example, if uh, if it's a monitored office uh, office gate or something, then uh, when employees swipe in their cards and then enter the room, like yeah, that can be represented as an event. So an employee entry or when they exit again, uh, that employee exited, that can be another event. So these kinds of events of like fire and forget kind of data can be represented uh, using this data type called events. And uh, with Internet Edge, we have we have introduced a kind of a representation for a generic representation for events. And uh, it's following the same principles as as it has uh, as it is for measurements. So yeah, you will be representing these events via MQ, like uh, via MQTT messages by publishing the event data to a dedicated topic. Okay, so here I've got my device connected already, and let me just navigate to the events dashboard. And currently there is nothing. So now if I want to <clears throat> generate an event, so I have to publish an MQTT message. So for that, I'm using the Tedge MQTT pub utility, uh, our own utility. And then you need to publish the event to Tedge events. So this Tedge events topic, and then the last uh, part in the uh, topic structure is the type of your event. Okay. So uh, let's say it's something like uh, device on event. So an event that is generally that is emitted when uh, when your device is switched on. Okay, so and that's it. Basically, uh, you can you can just send even an empty message to this particular event if you don't really want to associate any additional data to that event, and that's that basically will create an event. So if I publish it, so you will see that in the event dashboard you have received the same event with the same type device on and all the additional data, the type, timestamp, etc. Okay. Now, if you want to associate additional information to the event, then it has to be done in a JSON format. So since we use thin JSON for all other data like measurements, etc. as well, so we follow in the same, uh, same format here as well. So uh, now you can, so events uh, payload data is fairly open, so you can send pretty much any JSON that you want. But there are some special fields that we handle uh, We handle in a specific way. For example, uh, if, you have a, if you have a text field in your JSON, okay, device turned on, if you send that, so without, when, when uh, when this device is connect connected to Cumulosity, uh, the Cumulosity mapper will actually pick this text field and then use that as the event text <coughs> when the same data is represented in Cumulosity. Okay, so uh, that's how the type, sorry, the text field will be handled, but the type will still be device on, which is derived from the topic, the MQTT topic. Okay, and then we support there are some additional fields as well. Like for example, there is a time field. That we support uh, with uh, that needs to be an ISO 8601 a time in the ISO 8601 format. So let me just get the current time. So 
think of the time explicitly. Okay. So this will add the time field. So associate a time to your event. And you can actually have any ad additional fields and fragments as well. So for example, when the device is turned on, assume that you want to report its battery percentage. Okay. You can do something like this. Battery percentage. Ninety. So, uh, this is in that. So you will see the new event appearing here, and it has the same text. It has the timestamp that we sent, which is fifteen thirty-three eighteen, and uh, the additional field that we sent as well, battery percentage, which is ninety. Okay. So this way you can basically uh, and any complex structure is uh, allowed here. So we don't really need any uh, strict validation. So it can be any JSON fragment, for example. Come on. I think it's properly formatted. Something like the capacity. Capacity. Capacity of the. Uh, if I send that, you will see of that, and yeah, you will see that additional fields also. So you can send any open structure, uh, open JSON uh, data with this events data model. So that's uh, pretty much all about events. And currently, yeah, this representation is there, but this mapping. Is currently supported only on Cumulosity. So if your device is connected to Cumulosity and if you are using the Cumulosity mapper, then whatever events that you locally publish on from a Thinest device to its local topics will be mapped to its equivalent events representation in Cumulosity as well. So we haven't added that support for the same in Azure or any other clouds yet. So yeah, that's uh, that's all about events. Now the next uh, data type that we added is alarms. So alarms can be uh, alarms are typically used to uh, raise alerts or signals uh, that requires an operator's attention. Okay. So something like, say, if, a, uh, if a, for a temperature sensor, if the temperature level goes beyond a certain threshold, then uh, you would want to alert the operator, the device operator, so that he takes some corrective action and and fixes the problem. Okay. So it's it's different from events in the sense that alarms. Once they are raised, they need to be explicitly cleared as well by the uh, by the operator. So events are not like that. So they, it doesn't need any uh, explicit actions. Once it's fired, yeah, it exists in the system that event exists. But for alarms, once it's raised, uh, the operator uh, managing the device is supposed to explicitly clear the alarm as well. Okay. So now to uh, look at to see how events work. So that also follows a very similar pattern uh, in terms of the messaging, the payload structure, etc. So once again, you have to send your messages to a dedicated uh, MQTT topic, and the topic will be something like this: Tedge alarms, okay, so events alarms, and then the next uh, next field in this topic structure is the severity of the alarm. Okay, and we support four levels of severity: critical, major, warning, and minor. Okay. So let me create a major alarm, which is say battery low. So this is the alarm type, and this is the uh, the severity. And again, uh, you can actually send it with no data if you don't want to uh, associate any additional data to that alarm. Okay. And as you can see in the UI, this alarm. Came here, so a battery low uh, major alarm has been uh, raised. Okay, now I'll just send one more uh, critical. So another, I'm raising another uh, critical alarm, battery critical. And here also in the payload, once again we have these special fields that we treat uh, in a special way. For example, or like like the text field. So you can associate some text like battery level is 
low and uh, then the time field as well. Okay. I'll use the same timestamp. And if I send that, so as you can see, the text that I gave in the text field, so that one was picked up rather than generating this generic error message as was done with the previous case when I didn't explicitly send the text. Okay. And it respects the timestamp as well 1538, 1538, 34. Okay. So this is how you will uh, raise the alarms. Okay. Now, as I said, like you uh, with alarms, you just don't raise the alarm, but you will take some corrective action. And once that corrective action is taken, you need to explicitly clear the alarm. So uh, the way to do that with Tinergy is that you will have to send once again a message to the same topic. So for example, if I want to clear this, this battery low alarm that I had raised earlier, what you need to do is you send another message to the same topic. But with an empty payload. So nothing. In that case, you will see that the message got cleared here. And you can do the same thing for the other, other thing as well. Critical. Critical. Yeah. So using empty payload, you can uh, clear your alarms as well. From uh, from thin edge and the same clear command will be mapped to cumulosity and then it will clear the same alarm from uh, cumulosity as well. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I had to show. And uh, in the case of alarms, like uh, this text and time field are the only ones that we handle specifically. But if you add any additional custom fields and fragments, they will just be ignored. They won't be sent to cumulosity like uh, what was done for uh, done with events. So events, in the case of events, even if you have additional custom free fields and fragments, they will be sent to cumulosity. But in the case of alarms, they'll just be ignored. Unless there is a strong need for that uh, comes up in future, then in that, in that case, we can consider extending that as well. Alarms also the same way as events. Yeah, that's all I uh, okay. had to do. Any questions? Yeah, um, one question. So this is actually to the right in the brackets is the payload you send to the topic, right? Yes. So this would also work if I just publish that in, in some other uh, code directly to that topic and I have to give it that, that JSON payload. Uh, exactly, yeah. So if okay. you're doing it programmatically with python or something like that yeah so the only thing is that so what this represents is just an empty payload so you can just have uh you can just create an mqtd message that doesn't have any payload and that's basically equivalent to this and then it will just create a critical alarm of that type uh in the case okay so in the case of in the case of alarms uh it's slightly different so in the case of alarm so this empty message, empty payload means clear the alarm. Ah, right? So ah, if sorry, you have nothing sorry. in the payload. Yeah, in the brackets, yeah. it's creating a, just one alarm of that type exactly. without any further information. Exactly. Okay, good. So in, in terms of how that works is you subscribe to some uh, hashtag alarms, alarms hashtag, mm -hmm. and then you just uh, look for, for um, some uh, messages published on below that and extract the, the severity and the type out of the topic. Exactly. OK, cool. Yeah. And yeah, I like it. Uh, so I guess the, the path parameters are the ones that are required, right? So in the case of events, it's the type. And for the alarms, it's the severity and the type. Is there a exactly. reason why the alarms start actually with the severity? Uh, and not with the type like the events do. Uh, like why they could be placed earlier. Yeah, I don't really have a 
concrete answer probably it would be like uh, christoph do you want to add something yeah. to that so but i'm not Wait, uh, yeah. just from uh, yeah. uh, just, just from a user point of view i i, I think it would be more consistent if if it would be th alarm slash type like like with the events and then maybe at severity at the end because just for me i i feel that in the hierarchy view you are looking at the type first and then potentially at the severity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's just a minor nitpick <laughs> i mean uh the the other question i have uh, is yeah, how do you actually Sorry. We had quite a bit of conversation on that topic. I, I don't know Christoph is if Christoph is around, he might have lots to say here. Uh, one of the thoughts was that in general, people uh, or general the use cases might be more around collecting uh, all the uh, looking at all the major or the critical uh, issues first, and maybe not much bother about the lower severity ones. So. Collating them through those uh, uh, those uh, that filtering would be priority before you look at a specific type of uh, alarm. That, that was the thought behind it, but happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So this, uh, so this is the case when you're subscribing to the topic, then you say you would rather subscribe to all major topics than exactly all the for all the major uh, uh, yeah. Alarms coming in, yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, but yeah, um, the subscriptions, MQTT level subscription, yeah, whether we swap it, yeah, it, it doesn't make, uh, like, it, it's pretty much the same. Like, we can make that change if, uh, if that. That has a I think it's in a uh, it's a kind of validated assumption <laughs> uh, on uh, how you want to group things. While in alarms, you want to group things by severity when 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 looking at them or events that might be by type. I think that might be the leading um, indicator here. Oh, okay. No, fine. Yeah, I don't have really experience on 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 working with this, obviously. So uh, I was just confused that it's not the same like the event. Uh, I see people being confused by that when when publishing things. Uh, I think the subscription one is yeah. So the other way around is probably valid if you want to group by severity. But then again, you're probably subscribing to a topic because you're looking for certain alarm types, I imagine. So because you want to handle them, right? So you're subscribing to battery critical alarms because you want to do something with it. If you subscribe to all major alarms and you would need to to filter out what type it is later on or whatever. You can that, as Albin was showing, you can do that also. So you do a... Yeah. a yeah, so th there are possibilities. I think try that out and give us more feedback. Yeah, sure. Um, the other question I had is uh, how do you actually change the severity then? Is it possible or you just have to clear one one alarm and create another one in this next severity level? Yeah, uh, so basically at the next level, even if you have like say uh, for the same alarm, if you have like if you raise it with major and uh, critical severity uh, there are basically we treat it as two different alarms of the same type but two different entities two different alarm entities but when they are mapped to cumulosity yeah as you said like yeah uh, we don't really do any update we don't treat like update the existing uh, alarm or anything like that uh, severity but just uh, straight away sent and cumulosity has this behavior where if you have say one alarm type which is major then if you send another critical alarm of the same type then instead of directly updating the critical the severity it just increases the count of the existing alarm that's already raised which will be the major one uh, so that's how it is so we are not using the uh, severity update apis currently because on thinage we treat them as two different independent alarms
Okay, so so I can see that being a use case where you handle an alarm and it goes, or it, if the alarm is longer than a period of time active, it, it increases in criticality or goes down, whatever. So so that's probably a use case. So you say you would just send another, create another one, and it would happen in the background, the, the change, or you do need to explicitly uh, delete the, the existing one. Uh, with the current implementation, we don't uh, delete the existing one. So we just uh, map. So for example, for example, if this major battery low alarm is sent, so uh, let's see that critical. And if I just convert it to major, we don't go and delete anything. So it just follows the normal normal uh, cumulosity behavior where only the count of the Previous released alarm is incremented because they are of the same type. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so this is probably a bit in, unintuitive for the yes. user. Yeah. Yes, yes. As a user, yes. Yeah, I struggled with it, but yeah, Cumulus has a uh, API that lets you explicitly change the severity of the uh, alarm. But yeah, that actually requires some context as to okay whether the alarm is already available and stuff like that. So it's a bit more involved. So. Yeah, we we are not using that API yet. Okay, okay, that means that we also cannot change the text afterwards. Uh, I haven't tested that, but most likely that's the case. So yes, typically tried because it's it's just increment in count count so i don't think any other all other uh, values in the alarm are uh, just ignored yeah the test is the text is also ignored alarm of type that critical so uh, the recommendation would be that like for different uh, if you have like different if you want to handle those differently then you yeah, probably use different types themselves mm. but yeah i understand that yeah this this behavior could be confusing yeah i think the use case that i've seen most often uses like you have one type of alarm but you have different thresholds and depending mm -hmm. on the thresholds it's either major or critical and depending on that also maybe the text may change so okay okay yeah so yeah I was explaining more like, yeah, so if it's a battery low, then it's, it's a different type. And if it's a critical level, then it will be a different type. And the major critical things are just used to uh, yeah. categorize them or like that. So. OK, just 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 to bear in mind, I know I know this is the first draft and I really think it's really good. It's going in the right direction. Um, just from the field, what what actually might happen with alarms is that they might include also some sort of workflow behind it, right? So you raise an alarm. There is somebody that is actually um, acknowledging it, and and maybe the system is raising an alarm. This alarm again. And the system, but the system is changing also the description of the alarm and all these changes that they will be stored in the um, audit log. And it, this caters really good for, for something like a, a history, what happened to an alarm. And so it really might be a good thing if we can change them afterwards, just to keep in mind. Okay, I'll keep a note. Uh, so basically, uh, change, not just the criticality or sorry, this, this, the severity, but uh, change the other parameters as well, like the text. Yes. Text, time to time. Okay. Changes. And you, you want that as the, uh, the default behavior, say, for example, in this case itself that I just showed, if someone raises the major alarm first and then follows it up by a minor alarm, then you don't want the the existing behavior that you just saw, but you would rather want it more like an update. 
Yes. And or that has an external separate option. I mean, if you use the REST API, you have to provide the alarm ID, the, the actual alarm ID. It, mm -hmm. And this is a put statement then. And then you can change every parameter of the alarm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's and another it context. works in MQTT. Being honest, I've never done it. So I, I it might introduce some challenges for you there, right? Yeah, so there is a, there is a uh, smartest template available that lets you uh, update the update an alarm as well. But then, as you said, like you you need some sort of a con uh, context, uh, and I, I'm not quite sure. I haven't played with it enough enough to s confirm whether it it lets you update all the fields like the text and timestamp fields as well, or just the severity allowed to try it again. But such an API exists, but it. Yeah, the that context that you mentioned, that's the that probably would be the challenging part. That I need to know that okay, there are, there is an already an X alarm exists already that I need to update rather than yeah, just sending update requests. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Arvind. So Q and A time is over. Uh, if you have uh, more questions or more requests, so please just Discord, GitHub. We have many channels mm -hmm. to communicate. Yeah, or even in this chat, I'll, I'll try to reply later on behind yeah, the questions. Yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rena. So, Alvin, actually, you uh, presented both stories, alarm, and event. So that means so all stories for today are done. And thanks to everyone for joining and also applause um, for the presenters. Yeah. And thanks. See you. Thank next you. Time. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye.